Good morning, everyone, and a warm welcome to the 27th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2023. Um, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. Are members content to consider the draft report on how is devolution changing post-EU in private at this meeting and future meetings and to consider a draft report on the pre-budget scrutiny 24-25 in private in future meetings? Thank you very much. Our next agenda item is to take evidence as part of our pre-budget scrutiny on funding for culture from, and a very warm welcome this morning, Angus Robertson, MSP, Cabinet Secretary for the Constitution, External Affairs and Culture, and um, he's joined by Penelope Cooper, Director of Culture and Major Events at the Scottish Government. So welcome to you both. And can I invite Mr Robertson to make a brief opening statement. Thanks very much, convener. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, thanks for your invitation to contribute to the committee's uh, discussion on the 2024-25 pre-budget scrutiny and for the opportunity to make some opening uh, comments to you. I'm a passionate supporter of the culture sector and the fundamental role that creativity and self-expression can play in everyone's lives, along with the economic value of cultural exports for Scotland, is crucial for our international connections, our ambitions uh, and our reputation. However, we all recognise the challenges that the sector has experienced through the pandemic and the cost of living crisis. Its international engagement has been directly impacted by Brexit, and this has led to financial fragility in parts of the sector, and the support for these cultural organisations has never been more critical. I appreciate that the sector is very concerned about what the future holds in terms of Scottish Government funding and support. And the responses that I've seen to this committee's call for views on culture budgets make sombre and extremely stark reading. I recognise the strength of feeling expressed by the culture sector this week over the funding for Creative Scotland, and I will address this shortly. I'd like to reassure you that I understand and appreciate the difficult situation that the sector is facing, and I've been discussing with my Cabinet colleagues about the important role that culture can play across the piece and pushing for the best possible settlement for the sector for next year. However, none of us are under any illusions about the challenges faced in our public finances. To illustrate this, the 2023-24 pay round will see an estimated additional £785 million spent on pay compared to our original central pay assumptions. This includes the agreed pay deals for teachers. This includes the agreed pay deals for NHS Agenda for Change, for doctors, for junior doctors, for dentists, for the fire service, plus the proposed offers of non-teaching local government staff, for the police and the Scottish Government's two-year offer. This figure also includes pay assumptions on the deal for, uh, deals for further education uh, and for the judiciary. To enable enhanced pay deals, we've had to make difficult decisions to reprioritise existing allocations. However, as all committees know, there is no unallocated pot of money from which to fund higher pay deals or extra support for those in need. So if the pay bill grows faster than our overall funding, it squeezes our wider capacity to maintain services. Every additional percentage point on a pay deal and every pound we spend on measures to help with rising costs must be funded by reductions elsewhere in our budgets. Last year, we prioritised funding for enhanced public sector pay deals to support those who need help most, spending over £900 million more than originally budgeted. However, alongside this, I recognise that the culture sector needs stability and the opportunity for longer-term planning and development. We are committed to developing a fairer funding approach for the wider third sector of which culture organisations are a key contributor. And I've had to make very tough choices to balance my budget this year in light of all of these challenges. So it's with regret that this includes not being able to top up Creative Scotland's lottery funding shortfall for this year. I know the sector is frustrated by this, but it's worth highlighting that the Scottish Government has topped up lottery funding for five years, two years more than were originally agreed. And this has meant providing an extra £33 million over the five years to Creative Scotland. I discussed this with the Board of Creative Scotland last week, and I was very grateful that the Board agreed to use its accumulated funding reserves to avoid passing on any impacts of this decision to its regularly funded organisations. 
I have assured the Board that the funding will be provided next year, subject to the normal parliamentary processes, and I have discussed this with the Deputy First Minister. We have an obligation to balance the Scottish Government budget each year and prioritise funding to deliver the best value for every taxpayer in Scotland. And as a result of rising costs and pressures on budgets across government, made more challenging as a result of UK inflation, we are continuing to work with partners to ensure all public investment is used to deliver the maximum benefit for communities and organisations across Scotland. This year we saw funding from the Scottish Government and partners across the country to help deliver the 2023 UCI Cycling World Championships. The event helped promote the health and well-being benefits of cycling and drive wider economic and social benefits across Scotland. But due to increased costs, including inflation, the total funding provided by the Scottish Government and partners to support the delivery of the championships is in the process of being finalised and final costs will be confirmed in due course, but are of the order of £8 million. Scottish Government funding for the event prior to its completion was delivered through our major events uh, budget. But since the conclusion of the event, any additional funding that may be required will be managed centrally by the Scottish Government. The programme for Government 2023 commits us to produce a plan to deliver improvements including greater clarity and consistency of existing arrangements, recognising the third sector's strategic role in enabling the transformation and delivery of person-centred services to the people of Scotland. And we will continue to build the case for the multi-year funding and will explore the extent of which it can be secured within unpredictable economic circumstances. Culture can also play a valuable preventative role in health settings and evidence has shown that participation in cultural events and activities can promote lifelong health and well-being, reduce social isolation, increase resilience and confidence and give individuals an increased sense of purpose and belonging to their communities. As announced in the programme for government, we will publish a refresh culture strategy action plan later this year and the culture strategy will set out a vision that recognises the value of culture and its power to inspire, enrich and transform our lives and communities. Our action plan will set out what actions we will take in response to the challenges brought about by this changed landscape. This commitment reaffirms my aim to place culture as a central consideration across all policy areas, making clear how culture can deliver on a range of priority outcomes, improving health and well-being, supporting a thriving economy, raising educational attainment, tackling inequality and realising a greener future. And it's more important than ever to work together to explore areas such as sharing back office functions, maximising income through philanthropy and perhaps more importantly enabling organisations to become more sustainable. And in a time of limited resource, collaboration rather than competition will be of significant benefit to the wider sector. Thank you very much, Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, um, and um, quite a lot of food for thought in all of that. Um, if I could ask um, just maybe an opening general question it is that um, you, you know that we have just published a report on culture and communities and um, your, your latter statements about um, the well-being and, and the, the opportunities that are there um, for wider society from culture um, are certainly echoed throughout that report. So I would just wonder if you could um, say a little bit about how your discussions have gone with colleagues in Cabinet with regards to mainstreaming and how the budget as set out will support those ambitions for this year? Well, this is a very live, ongoing and, and continuing conversation and, and it's one that will continue ad infinitum so long as the government is, is committed to mainstreaming culture across government and realising the full potential benefits of culture and the arts sector uh, across government. Uh, and I think there are aspects of that which we haven't fully understood the, the potential of. I think people around the table, I should say incidentally, sorry, a warm welcome to the newer members of the committee for whom this is my first evidence session uh, before you. Um, as I've mentioned in previous um, evidence sessions, I think it's, it's clear to most that there are benefits that everybody understands uh, that can accrue in health, in education, perhaps in justice and, and other policy areas. But I think most people think of that in terms of, well, that might benefit people who are patients in health. 
uh, or who might be um, children or young people in education, um, or might be prisoners in a justice setting. But it's not just that. It's about the people who are working in the health service as well. It's the people who are teaching. It's about the people who work in our, in our justice system as well. And so I think there are real opportunities that we need to explore, but explore in the round, because if it's possible by making uh, interventions that can help with mental health, with anxiety, that can help with a whole range of things which impact on, on the workforce, as well as patients and pupils and, and so on, um, I think there is uh, hope to, to believe that not only will this be intrinsically of value to all of the people that it might um, help, but it could have an impact, and there's some, there's some evidence to show this, um, on, um, uh, on working patterns as well in, in public services. So I think we need to understand across government that not only is it potentially something that costs, but it's also something that brings savings. I think we all understand the, the, the beyond financial um, uh, advantages, but I think there is a financial dimension to all of this, um, and I look forward to um, working with my colleagues on helping people understand that it's not just a cost um, to, to mainstream uh, culture or introduce social prescribing, as an example. It also brings benefit that, exi that, that offsets existing outgoings. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'm going to move to questions for the committee. I'm going to bring Ms Forbes in first. I think Ms Forbes has indicated to me she has a number of questions. So if, if there are supplementaries on those questions, I'll bring members in, but otherwise I'll then come to, to different lines of questioning. But if I can invite Ms Forbes <coughs> first. Thanks. Thanks, Convener, and uh, welcome, Cabinet Secretary. We obviously had Creative Scotland in front of us last week expressing some concerns, as they also did in the public realm, about recent funding decisions. And so I had a few questions uh, about that. And I think the starting place is to go back to your statement, because there was a lot of information in that statement. So for absolute clarity, can, can you um, explain to us, uh, as a result of recent decisions, has any culture organisation seen an unexpected change in their funding allocation for this year? How much information and how much discussion did you have with Creative Scotland before coming to any of the, the recent decisions? Um, and lastly, what is it that you're promising in, in your statement in terms of budget impact this year and in subsequent years as a result of some of those pressures now being managed corporately and centrally rather than by the culture portfolio? So there's, oh goodness. <laughs> There's, there, there's a lot in all of that. There's, there's, there's a lot in all of that. Um, so, um, firstly, in terms of regularly funded uh, organisations, I can do no better than, uh, than quote from Ian Munro from Creative Scotland in his evidence to you um, that the use of reserves by Creative Scotland, and I quote, will enable us, Creative Scotland, to maintain the payment for the regularly funded organisations as planned, without the cut being applied. He then went on to say, given that this £6.6 .6 million is a one-off and that we are using our reserves to offset it, we are protecting the balance of the reserves position to enable transition support as far as we reasonably can, and then goes on to say that it stabilises the situation. So from Creative uh, Scotland's um, perspective, and I'm immensely grateful for the collaborative approach that we're taking to the funding pressures that we're all having to, to manage, in effect, what we have been able to do is ensure that there is no impact on Scotland, Scotland's cultural organisations as a result of um, uh, the funding decision. Um, that we, there are discussions that will take place about next year's finances and the year after that. The commitment has been given for the £6.6 .6 million uh, uh, from this year. It will be paid. Uh, during the next financial year, uh, but I think for those who may have been given an impression that there is going to be a cut that is going to be imposed on cultural organisations as a result of this decision, that is factually inaccurate, and I don't think it's particularly helpful given the wider concerns that are quite rightly there about the financial pressures that there are on the, um, on the cultural uh, sector. To the wider point, um, I think 
Well, the first, thing to, the, the first thing to reflect on is that the particular challenge that we're facing right now is that we are coming towards the end of a financial year. So what happens when you are in a financial year in which there have been unprecedented additional cost pressures, and I outlined those in terms of all of the, um, uh, the funding settlements for, uh, for uh, pay, uh, means that money needs to be found elsewhere. But of course, one has already allocated a significant part of the annual spend throughout the earlier part of the year. So one is looking at a much smaller part of the, um, the budget for the end of the year, but with a reduced amount of, of money to deal with that. And so that's why we are in this um, uh, particularly challenging uh, situation of in-year budget finance. So as you would expect somebody in my position uh, to do, you have to look at that and work out, well, what are the options to do this? And I think the best way of explaining it, I think there are three, three dimensions to the funding challenge that we face within this portfolio. One was related to major events, uh, which are part of the portfolio, as you know. And those major events during this year have included the UCI World Cycling Championships, which I, I think, by common consensus, have been an amazing success for Scotland, but they have incurred extra costs. Uh, the second uh, part of the, um, the funding challenge related to uh, the, the last payment to Creative Scotland within the, the, this financial uh, year of, of £6.6 uh, million. Pounds. And then you have a remainder, which is the uncontracted remaining spend in the, in the, in the culture uh, area. So given these particular challenges, we need to find a solution to all of these three things. They're not going to go away. We have to face them. What are we going to do with that? To the first part of the equation, and I've, <coughs> I've acknowledged that this is, although the finalised figure needs to be worked out, off the order of an £8 million um, uh, amount that is required, required uh, in relation to uh, the UCI Cycling World Championships, something which brought benefit across Scotland and across government, um, that the Scottish Government has agreed that this is something should be borne across government rather than simply within the portfolio. Now, that is a hugely significant uh, decision for um, the portfolio. We're the second smallest um, in the Scottish Government. So that kind of amount is very, very significant in terms of the, uh, the spending um, that, we, um, that we have. The second um, challenge in terms of um, uh, the end-of-year finance related to um, Creative Scotland and the £6.6 .6 million pounds <coughs> payment, um, and by Creative Scotland making the decision that they did uh, to use reserves, means that the Scottish Government and, and our, our budget, which is, is under significant pressure, uh, that that challenge is, is obviated from a government point of view and is obviated from the, the point of view of the regularly funded organisations that are expecting their payments imminently. I understand that Creative Scotland is in the process of informing them that they are going to be paid as they were expecting to, to be paid and have the assurance um, uh, on that. And what that then leaves is the, um, is the final amount in terms of the uncontracted um, uh, spend for the rest of the year. And I am confident that we are going to be able, as a result of making uh, decisions in, in these three areas, um, that we will, there will be challenges, of course, um, but that we will be able to make sure that we are, um, we are able to fund um, areas right across uh, the, the culture portfolio, which would have otherwise have been under threat without the opportunity of using reserves. And so that, that is the key thing to understand about trying to find a solution to these funding pressures. So none of this is easy. It's involved uh, colleagues in government, in the culture sector, um, uh, to, uh, to work with us um, to make sure that we can get ourselves in the best possible situation in this very challenging situation. And I, I think that we have achieved a good result uh, given those, pre those pressures. Did Sorry, did I answer all of your, um, your, your questions, well, I, which were packaged in one? follow-up to, for clarity, and then I'll stop. Right, I'll bring Mr Ruskell in, yeah, and then I'll come back yeah. to Kate and take both questions <coughs> together. Thanks. I think the nub of the concern from the creative sector was about the demand on the multi-year fund that Creative Scotland have, have set up. 
and the, and the expectation that organisations that were uh, not getting approval for multi-year funding would then be able to apply for a separate fund um, which would, would have come out of uh, Creative Scotland's reserves um, for more single-year funding. I think, I think that's the hub of the, the, the concern, the nub of the concern that we've had from um, creative industry. Can you, can you explain how the current set of decisions really impact on that? Will Creative Scotland still be able to fund those organisations that have not been successful in achieving multi-year funding but still are very much on the brink and still need that year-on-year -year funding in order to survive into next financial year? So I, I absolutely acknowledge that that is where the concern lies uh, for people, for, <clears throat> for those uh, watching our proceedings who are hearing all of this terminology around uh, culture funding. Um, the importance of multi-year funding is one that I think w we all understand. It's a new approach which I, I think has cross-party support as being the best way for cultural organisations and I think there's a, 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 a wish to, to roll that out more widely into the third sector. It's a way of helping organisations not have to apply every single year uh, for funding uh, and instead uh, when the strong uh, case is made for financial uh, support that one receives it for, in this case, a three-year um, three year, year period um, uh, and that is going to be to the benefit of cultural organisations. Now, as Mr Ruskell has, has uh, indicated, this is a change from the current situation and there is an expectation um, that um, many of our leading cultural organisations will be in receipt of multi-year funding, but there's a concern amongst some that they won't, they won't receive that, and Creative Scotland has been working very hard to try and find a way of making sure that they are still financially supported. Mm -hmm. um, and that, for them, is the requirement for the use of their reserves. So that's just the background yeah. to Mr Ruskell's I'm, point, I'm I think. I'm the background. I think many people in, watching this will have watched you know, last week's session as well, and they'll be in the thick okay. of it in terms of putting Good. in applications. Yeah. I suppose the question then is, is, come back to the question, is what, what changes now? So well. nothing changes. There okay. is no detriment. Right. So um, Creative Scotland um, will be introducing their multi-annual uh, payment system next year, so they would not be calling on the reserves right now within this financial year uh, to deal with the change to this multi-annual uh, funding uh, system, uh, and they will be, um, they will be receiving the £6.6 .6 million, pounds, which is an offset from lost income in relation to the national lottery. So we are stepping in to help Creative Scotland, and we've been doing that more than, than we were expected to do so. We will be doing so again next year, but to the key point of will this have an impact um, uh, on the ability of Creative Scotland to introduce multi-year funding, to have um, the means at their disposal in the quantum that they were hoping to have, it will make no difference. There will be zero detriment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Baby. Secretary, um, you'll be aware that we've heard alarming evidence over the recent weeks over this funding crisis affecting the culture sector. Um, even before last week's announcement, the Creative Scotland were warning that up to a third of the 120 regularly funded organisations are at serious risk of insolvency in the short term and over half are financially weak. Uh, Literature Alliance Scotland said if government funding was to cut or remain at standstill, it would be a disaster. Museums Gallery Scotland have talked about a hauling out of museum services. VOCO have talked about the level of publicly funded cultural service provision has been depleted to the most basic level. Prospect, we are at a breaking point. Federation of Scottish Theatres, continued lack of public investment may result in what could be very easily be seen as the willful demise of the culture sector as we know it. Now, you mentioned earlier the Scottish Government is talking about a, a new culture strategy and vision. Um, but it's clear the evidence that we are getting from multiple stakeholders that, that we've been talking to are saying, although there is considerable ambition from the government, the levels of investment do not match that uh, ambition. And we've heard, you know, you, you talk about the importance of the culture sector this morning. But there is a feeling that this is the very definition of setting up the culture sector to fail, having that level of ambition but not having that investment. Do you think they're right or wrong? Well, I think cultural organisations are right to describe the pressures under which they are, are operating. And as we've heard in previous um, 
sessions, and I've given evidence to you before, we're well aware of organisations. We've seen the Film House, we've seen uh, Dance Base, we've seen uh, additional requirements for the likes of the King's Theatre, we see other organisations which um, have been flagging up that they have, they're under significant financial pressure. We acknowledge that. Um, and that's why we've been working uh, with Creative Scotland, um, uh, who are, um, uh, have been working and continue to work with organisations that are uh, facing particular uh, financial uh, challenges. Uh, I, I, I entirely acknowledge uh, the, the evidence that has been given that there is a wish for culture uh, to receive additional funding. And if I'm able to secure additional funding for culture, that is exactly what I would like to see, uh, to see happen. But at the same time, we also need to, we also need to approach uh, the funding and support of, of culture um, in, in other ways as well. So if it's possible for us to um, help in terms of commercial income to the cultural sector, we need to do that. If it's possible to secure additional uh, support uh, from philanthropy, that's something that we need to do. So right across the piece, we're focused on absolutely making sure that the government provides the maximum funding that we are, are able to secure and I refer, Mr Bibby, to the wider financial pressures that we had. It's not as simple as saying we would like more money and then magically more money appears um, because I think he understands that things are, are, are such that if, it's, um, if we're wanting more money from here, it means the cost needs to be borne uh, elsewhere or indeed cuts need to be made uh, elsewhere. So this is not a simple situation. Having said that, I think there's an, an understanding uh, not just to the pressures that have been uh, shared with the committee, but also the significant benefit uh, that is accrued, not least to the Scottish economy, uh, from the creative uh, sector. And again, you've received evidence of the financial benefit that are brought from uh, festivals, as a good example, uh, that are brought from the screen sector, um, uh, when measured against the amount of money that is invested from the public purse. So there's a really strong financial case, there's a really strong uh, wider societal case because of the role that culture plays in terms of social inclusion and you know, health and well-being and all of these things which are key priorities to the Scottish Government. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that we match the ambition of all of those things with the funding that we can uh, secure in extremely pressed financial uh, uh, time. So if, if colleagues uh, on the committee, indeed colleagues in other parties, uh, have particular suggestions about how that can be best achieved, I, I, would, be, I would be pleased to hear that. Thank you for that answer. Uh, well, one area where the government hasn't matched its ambition with investment is the 6.6 .6 million 10% cut to Creative Scotland's budget, um, which you promised not to proceed with in February, but have gone ahead with in September. Um, the amount of money is vastly important to the sector. Um, in the context of the overall Scottish budget, I think it is about 0. 0.0. At one percent, we know the, the the benefits the culture sector provides to the economy, to health, to the justice sector. You've mentioned that al mm. already. Um, the, the issue is, is that just one words? Because people watching this would say, "Yeah, you're acknowledging the benefits of the culture sector as plain cabinet secretary, but you're cutting our budget at a time when we need uh, that resource." And so, if you really do think it represents value for money, if you really do think uh, so benefit to the wider society, not just the culture sector. Why are you, why are you proceeding with these cuts and every penny of those cuts? Yeah. So the, I think the key word is there, and I have mentioned it a number of times, is reserves. And where we are in a position, not just in the culture sector, but right across government, uh, if there are parts of the public sector that are in a position to hold reserves, and reserves are there for when we are in times of, of uh, duress, uh, that if reserves are going to make a material difference to the extreme situation that we find there, frankly, they should be used. And that's exactly what is happening. So I think it's very important, and I've now said it a number of times, and I think it's, in, it's really important to, to land this point, um, that there is zero cut being passed on to regularly funded organisations in the culture sector because reserves are being used 
now, which will be replenished in Creative Scotland's uh, budgetary terms next year. Um, and I think I've also explained the rationale as to why there is a difference between the start of this year and the end of this year, given the massive additional and unforeseen pressures uh, that have been brought to bear on public finances uh, in Scotland. So the, 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 to answer uh, Mr Bibby's point, the key um, point in all of this is reserves, and Creative Scotland have reserves uh, because the Scottish Government has provided funding uh, to it and it has been able to build up those reserves. So given that, um, and my explanation about the three uh, areas of particular pressure on the, the portfolio uh, budget, if that was not going to be done, then that amount of money would then have counted against all of the remaining uncontracted spend in the culture budget. And you can take it from me that if we think that people's concerns in relation to Creative Scotland's budgetary situation, even with the use of reserves, uh, is significant, I can assure Mr Bibby that this would be of con the considerable order higher as a concern in the culture sector. So I think we've managed to get ourselves into a, a situation where uh, the Scottish Government is, is recognising that when there are major events um, where there's a potential uh, for additional costs associated with them, that these uh, should be borne across government. I think that's a really good result uh, for, for culture. I think in terms of Creative Scotland's situation, that without detriment and with no impact to regularly funded organisations, because they have reserves, and, and that position will be maintained uh, next year, uh, that we have the best of, of potential outcome, given these three challenges, that we could have. Uh, and I'm pleased that we've managed to get there. But the, the short answer to Mr Booby's question is reserves is the difference. And they're there for difficult circumstances. And those are indeed what we find ourselves in financially at the present time. Well, as the Cabinet Secretary said, reserves are there for difficult times. The Campaign for Arts have said, yeah, they're there for emergencies, but not emergencies created by the Scottish Government in terms of the funding decisions that have been made. There is huge anger out there. Um, there's been a petition launched. 13,000 people have signed it. We've had equity union outside. There's pe members of his own party are very concerned about uh, these cuts. The Cabinet Secretary, you, and you've mentioned the Finance Secretary and Deputy First Minister, has made a commitment to, that funding will be restored next year. But what's that, what's that worth? When you've reneged on your promise this year over funding, why should anyone in the culture sector believe that, oh yeah, we're going to introduce it next year? Well, I've given, the assurance, not, I, I've given the assurance in February. I've, I've given the assurance to Creative Scot the Creative Scotland Board. They have accepted my assurance and they've been prepared to use the reserves. So, so they have accepted my assurance. Whether I can persuade Mr Bibby to accept mine or not is clearly a different uh, question. It is absolutely uh, my, my pledge that they will uh, see their £6.6 .6 million that they are, are now releasing from their reserves um, uh, will be restored uh, to them. And I, I, I understand why that's important for the reasons I gave earlier in relationship to, to multi-annual uh, multi year uh, funding. And that is something that will go ahead next year. People obviously accepted your assurance in February, but that you know, turned out to uh, not be worth any money, literally any money. Um, in terms of that commitment next year, that's a goal-plated commitment. It is. There's yes. no, there's no get-out caveats you want to tell us about now. No. Nope. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, just to say a bit for a bigger picture, um, we had a lengthy list of quotes read out from Mr. Bibby there. He didn't quote any of the evidence we heard about the cause of it not being the Scottish government, but being inflation, Brexit, huge increases in energy costs, all of which were itemised. And also, there's quite a number of positive comments, including the fact, quite surprisingly to me, that in Scotland, some of, the, some of the sector has higher wage levels than they do even in London, just for context. One thing, though, I find a bit murky, it's a very different um, tenor of evidence we're hearing today from that which we heard last week, crucially in relation to the issue of reserves, which is central to a lot of this. I asked Creative Scotland if a single penny of those reserves had derived from the Scottish Government, and they said no. That seems to be at odds with what you said, and also from what I'm reading and the evidence we have, that the Scottish Government has continually topped up 
a reducing level of funding from the National Lottery. So just for clarity, is it your view that the reserves, which are quite legitimately being used in this situation, have been contributed to by the Scottish Government or, or not? It's undoubtedly the case that the uh, funding that has um, uh, been given to uh, Creative Scotland in relation to the reducing level of national lottery uh, uh, payments uh, has assisted them in being able to accrue reserves, which I think uh, have totaled most recently £17 million. Uh, and clearly that is important to them. Uh, and I acknowledge that. But I think, I mean, Mr. Brown is absolutely right to say uh, that uh, the commitment of the Scottish Government to step in, to step in, uh, to bridge this funding gap was foreseen for three years and we have maintained that for five years. Um, now, now, notwithstanding that, uh, I think uh, for the reasons that we've already explored a bit in terms of the importance of multi-annual year funding and the changes, the positive impact that that will have on the culture sector, it's what they want, it's what the Scottish Government wants, but it is a, it's a huge transition uh, program from Creative Scotland, who, who do that on, on, uh, on behalf of uh, the administration of, of the culture sector uh, in Scotland, um, they need to, to know that they have the resources in place when that process kicks in. And as I've said a number of times from a number of different angles, um, uh, that they are going to have the funding that they expected to have in place, that they require to have in place, uh, so that they're able uh, to do that. That's a separate issue to uh, global culture uh, budgets um, of the Scottish Government, uh, but as, as I've already said, um, that is something that I uh, will be approaching um, with my colleagues in government to make sure that we have the best uh, possible uh, settlement. But uh, the, the fact that uh, Creative Scotland has been able to build up reserves, of course, is reflected in the fact that they have received funding from the Scottish Government, uh, frankly, in addition uh, and above the monies that have been, have been lost from a reducing amount from the National Lottery. Uh, and one final uh, question, really. If we accept, as some of us do, that we've had 13 years of austerity and reducing budgets, and that the Scottish Government has got a largely fixed budget apportioned to it, depending on what happens elsewhere in the UK, um, then you can see why 13 years is starting to really have an effect. And I think one of the things that we heard from the organisations last week was, you mentioned it earlier on, <laughs> the increase in costs set aside, mm -hmm. relatively standstill budgets. So in addition to giving the assurance which you have given that nobody will receive a cut, which is really important, I think, to, to get that message out, will you continue to keep your eyes open and your efforts focused on anything further that can be done to help individual um, actors within the sector to deal with those extraordinary pressures which are currently faced, not least in relation to um, uh, energy costs, although the other issue that we were hearing about was talent loss, yeah. uh, especially going down to London. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Mr Brown's absolutely right to bring up uh, the, the fact that the pressures that are being borne by the Scottish Government in terms of the Scottish Government's um, uh, constrained income and constrained ability do, to do anything about that is matched by the constraints that are being felt in the, in the culture sector. Yes, um, uh, inflation in general, but as I'm sure many would have told you, that there are parts of the culture sector where inflation is significantly higher than inflation more generally. Um, the impact of, of higher heating costs, and, and the list goes on and on and on for different cultural organisations, means there's a double whammy. The ability of government to do everything that we would like to do, being constrained, and the ability of the, the culture sector, cultural organisations, venues and, and everything else, themselves with a significantly constrained budget, and not forgetting, we haven't even mentioned it yet, the impact that COVID has had um, uh, on their finances, but also on uh, societal attitudes towards going out, attending major events, and, and so on. These I mean, massive shocks, which uh, the Scottish Government f fully acknowledges. And uh, given all of that, not only are we trying to do everything to make sure that the funding is in place, given all of that, 
um, given all of that uh, extremity, but it's also where one can intervene uh, with organisations, and some of those are in the public realm. A great number of them are not. Uh, and it's absolutely essential that we help as many organisations, venues, festivals, uh, and so on, and not only to keep their head above water, but to thrive as we recover from uh, from COVID. But I think we do also need to acknowledge that there is a, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a there are changes in the way that people are enjoying cultural offering. Um, there are, are differences in the way that uh, events are, are are planned and under, and funded and, and undertaken. And we need to work with everybody in the culture and arts community. Um, in this period of, of change and obviously uncertainty uh, as well. So we need to give as much assurance uh, as we possibly can, which is why it's really important that when uh, there is going to be no detrimental impact on our major uh, arts uh, funding uh, body because they have reserves to use, uh, it's important that, that people hear that um, and that we uh, don't add uh, to uh, the, the, the wider concerns that people rightly have um, and that we need to, we need to deal with. Okay. Uh, Mr Stewart. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, the creative sector has always been resilient. Uh, I think we've all acknowledged that. Uh, and you said in your opening statement that there was frustration uh, with this process. Uh, I would suggest that that's probably enragement uh, at the least, uh, and that Creative Scotland, like many organisations, does have a reserves and they are there for potentially a rainy day. Well, it's very much a rainy day today for them. Uh, the reserves have saved the day for many of these organisations. You've acknowledged that, uh, and you indicate there'll be no detrimental impact. Uh, but many of these organisations that we've heard evidence over the last few weeks have said that uh, they are still struggling to manage. Uh, they are, they've talked about a perfect storm that's been discussed uh, many times in the past. Uh, and there is a real fear and anxiety uh, that the sector is on the brink. Uh, and the deeds and actions of the Scottish Government have not helped in that process over the last few weeks with the anxiety and, and difficulty. We wouldn't have had the, the demonstrations, the petitions, etc., uh, if they believed uh, that everything in the garden was reasonably going in the right direction. That's not the case. Uh, they believe that, as I say, uh, they are under attack, they are under threat, and they are fighting for their survival. I've asked uh, questions over the last few weeks about the, the strategies, the working groups, and the uh, action plans that the Scottish Government put together. These plans all seem to show that there is a, a desire uh, to attract, to support, to be involved, uh, but the deeds uh, that we see don't seem to marry up to that. And I think that's where there is the frustration, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, with the sector. Uh, and, and I think you know, the sector needs that reassurance. And at the moment, you know, they don't have that reassurance. You know, someone said at the demonstration this week, was, was it a mistake? Did you make a mistake by not putting the money back? Uh, because they couldn't believe uh, that they'd be at this stage. So, thank you very much, and welcome to, to Mr Stewart, to the, um, uh, uh, to the uh, committee. I'm, I'm not sure whether he brought up, uh, by way of reassurance, when he met with those people outside the Scottish Parliament, the... Um, uh, the avowed uh, commitments of uh, Creative Scotland and their reserves. I don't know whether he took the opportunity to give people reassurance um, about the fact that um, there would be no uh, detriment. This was, of course, in the, in the public realm um, at that stage. I think it's really important that when we are in uh, receipt of the facts, that all of us make sure that we are uh, using those to make sure that um, where there are uh, concerns which are, are less well-founded, uh, that we can assuage those concerns. And I think we've been able to do that today um, uh, in relation to Creative Scotland, its funding and its use of reserves. In, in terms of the wider anxieties and concerns, I totally acknowledge uh, those. And um, Mr um, Stewart has, has definitely... Uh, given me um, some food for thought 
about how is it that we are able to report um, the very considerable efforts of our organisations, whether they're Creative Scotland, whether they're Screen Scotland and others, who have been working tirelessly with organisations that are suffering distress. Because I certainly wouldn't want any impression to be created that there is a lack of intervention, a lack of concern, a lack of impact from our agencies in, in assisting. Um, and I would want to put on record, convener, my appreciation to everybody who has been involved in that. I mean, maybe it's the nature of this, because we, in, in, we're often talking about uh, commercial organisations that have been getting into difficult uh, situations. So, you know, not everybody wants uh, that kind of information to be in, in, in the public uh, space. But I, I, I can give him the absolute assurance um, that there have been game-changing interventions on a regular basis because the Scottish government-funded public organisations are assisting the cultural uh, sector to get through these difficult times. But where it is possible for us, in, and he, he mentions uh, culture strategy and so on, and updated uh, versions, um, if, if it's possible uh, for us, uh, perhaps... Uh, to give some case studies, insight, understanding um, of the uh, assistance that has been provided to help venues, organisations uh, and indeed um, individual um, uh, uh, artists um, continue to work in the sector. Um, I mean, there, th there is a challenge. Um, and this was certainly the case uh, during COVID, and for some it remains, of people making decision, decisions about whether they want to remain active or can remain active in, in the culture and creative uh, sector. And we need to do everything that we can to give people um, uh, the best support so that they're able to do that. But he definitely leaves a thought with me, which I will take away and happily share and update the committee on about how, how can we help um, inform you all about the interventions that are making pr profound impacts. I think that would be uh, beneficial. But, I mean, you had Ian Munro, you had uh, Isabel Davis uh, here, and no doubt they will be back, and I'm sure that they would be happy to provide you with the information that, that they can, because it is, it, is they who are doing, uh, it is they who are doing the heavy lifting and all of this, and I'm very appreciative for it. Because you, you identify, Cabinet Secretary, that the, the sector is, as I say, managing and progressing, and, and there, there have been interventions already. Yeah. But there was real fear and anxiety from some of the individuals who we've heard from in evidence that things could not remain the same. Uh, the culture sector needs to adapt. It has adapted. I've talked about that resilience we've already got. Uh, but there could well be casualties. Uh, and they've indicated that, that, that casualties are, are taking place in some areas and some communities. Uh, and it's, it's how to balance that, uh, Cabinet Secretary, to ensure that we have this phenomenal sector that is world-leading, that punched above its weight, yeah. does all of that. We've heard that time and yeah. time again. Uh, but without the stability that government can give, uh, they can find financing from other, for other sectors or support mechanisms, sponsorship, all of that. But the stability that government can give is vitally important. Uh, and you, you have to acknowledge that at the moment that that confidence from government has been dented uh, by the recent events that have taken place. So I, I completely agree with Mr Stewart in, in as much as things cannot remain the same because things around us are changing and so we need to react to those changes and we need to make sure that our, our, our cultural organisations and our cultural funding organisations are best placed to be able to deal with that changing circumstance. But I'm, I'm sure Mr Stewart wouldn't want to create the impression that changes are not taking place in terms of cultural organisations or indeed mm -hmm. their funding. We've had some discussion this morning about multi-annual funding, which mm -hmm. is a demand from the sector, Absolutely. is supported from the Scottish Government, is being introduced by uh, Creative Scotland. That in itself will lead to a wider set of questions of, uh, of those that then are not part of the multi-annual uh, funding uh, system and, and how do they have the stability that they want. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is change is the only constant in all of this and we have to make sure that we find the best way uh, through that. I mean I suppose 
you know, I'm gently trying to make the, um, uh, the point that I think it's really important that given the anxiety that there is out there, uh, that where uh, certainty of funding and finance is assured, that we need to um, do everything that we can to help people understand that that is indeed the case. And I think in terms of the evidence that I've been able to provide to the committee this morning about the, the particular funding challenges, the, um, um, the issue of major events, um, uh, which um, we have been able to, to secure progress on. And I think that is something that we are uh, going to have to return um, to in terms of finding the right funding mechanism across government, mm -hmm. uh, because Scotland has a really excellent reputation. Mr Stewart was right to talk about Scotland being world leading, and one of those areas where we are world leading is in major events, mm -hmm. as we saw with the Cycling World Championships. But we have other events coming up, um, uh, uh, including uh, major football events. Um, and so we're going to need to make sure that that funding mechanism across government um, is uh, in place. The fact that, that Creative Scotland um, is, is assured of its uh, funding situation through the use of, of reserves um, should, and you know, the, the regularly funded organisations are being informed this, are, are getting the uh, support that they were expecting to get, so there is no detriment there. And in terms of the, uh, the wider non-contracted spend, we are now in a, a significantly better place of being able to make sure that the stability that Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart uh, has, has quite rightly underlined is so important to the sector is one that we are going to be able, we are going to, be able to provide. And lastly, the, obviously following on from that, there is talk about stability and ring fencing has been discussed in a number of occasions by a number of organisations as to what would help uh, protect or would help enhance. Uh, what are your views about that, Cabinet Secretary? Well, in general, as we know with ring fencing, one person's ring fencing is another person's the instruction of others who should be able to make decisions to make decisions. Uh, we hear that in local government a lot, don't we? And it, you know, there's, a, there's a pendulum effect of where public opinion is in that. But, I mean, to an extent, there is budgetary ring fencing already. Mm -hmm. uh, because if one looks at the different budget lines within... Uh, within uh, the, the, the portfolio, there are different ways in which, for example, festivals are, are supported. Um, so, I mean, I have always been open-minded to, to good ideas. So whether that's from the culture sector, whether that's to the committee as a committee whose reports are, are excellent, and I say that not just before, because I'm appearing before the, uh, the committee, but I say to colleagues, especially to colleagues from other political parties, mm -hmm. If there are genuine suggestions about how things could better be organised, I appeal for people's input on these things. And I appreciate I have to sit here in the hot chair and answer for what we are doing in, in government. And I appreciate opposition colleagues need to, to do what they do um, uh, in between. But, you know, there's no monopoly on common sense. Um, uh, with things. So if there are different funding approaches, and one of the things that I'm, I'm very interested in is what is it that we can learn from other jurisdictions? What is it we can learn from other countries yes. about uh, how do they fund um, the creative and, and art sector? And uh, we've already brought up in the past convener the likes of the, the percentage for the arts, mm -hmm. which is a potential funding stream, mm -hmm. um, new funding stream. Um, we, I think we should acknowledge, we must acknowledge, um, the tremendous benefit that is, is derived from philanthropy. Mm -hmm. So I was at the opening event for the National Galleries um, uh, last week, which was significantly supported by Scottish Government uh, funding, which is absolutely world class. I'd encourage all colleagues, if they've not yet been there, uh, to go. But what struck me being at the event, it was... Um, the opening event where a lot of the, the key supporters of the project were there were people that one wouldn't know because they don't advertise it are incredibly generous uh, towards, in this case, the National Gallery, but you could say the V&A Dundee, you could say Celtic Connections, you could say any number of things. And I think, frankly, there's much more that needs to be done in the philanthropy space 
not just to work with people who are so generous, but frankly to say thank you, mm -hmm. um, because we need to work in partnership to make sure that we're, we're, uh, we're providing the maximum resource. And we need to be aware that there is significant financial uh, support that comes to culture organisations uh, and venues in Scotland, not from here. No. Absolutely. So there are, amongst others, people from the Scottish diaspora yeah. who contribute really generously. So I think there's, there's, there's more that we can do in that space. And if, if Mr Stewart has new ideas about how we can be doing that, I, am, I would be delighted to work with him on those. Thank you, Convener. Um, Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning to the Cabinet Secretary. Um, I don't need to, to tell him how fragile the culture sector is in Scotland for, for lots of reasons. And last year, this committee's report described what was then a perfect storm, I think, were the words we used. Since then, uh, particularly in the last month, the evidence this committee has heard has been very stark indeed and almost universal in its description of the anxiety that this sector feels. Uh, one person who gave evidence to us was uh, Liam Sinclair of the S Federation of Scottish Theatre. He said this, and I'm going to read it at length. I apologise for, for that. And he said this, a material issue since the last time the committee took evidence ahead of the budget relates to the journey through the Parliament that the Scottish Government took the culture budget on last year. It would be difficult to overstate the erosion of faith and trust among our members that resulted from that journey. The culture budget was cut, albeit that funding was reinstated, which left people feeling less clear than they should have been about the vision under which we are all operating for the delivery of cultural services in Scotland. That evidence was given before the events of last week, before the events of last week. Can you understand that people rightly view this as a promise being made and then a promise being broken? And can you understand the irreparable damage done to trust in the Scottish Government by that decision before we even get to the financial impact? So I think, I think the key reflection I would make to Mr Cameron's observations there are to, 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 use his own, uh, to use his own expression, that evidence was given before. And that evidence was given before the assurances by Ian Munro of Creative Scotland around the use of reserves, and it was given before the assurances have been given to regularly funded organisations, and it's evidence that has been given before uh, this session where the clarity on Creative Scotland's zero detriment in relation to their, fun their funding has been given repeatedly. Now, <clears throat> I view that separately uh, from the very particular concerns that there are in relation to venues, theatres are being a big part of them, uh, on the significant challenges that they are, are facing. And I know that Creative Scotland is working with venues, is working with theatres, uh, to make sure that we are able to do everything that we are, uh, that we are able to do to make sure uh, that they uh, are, are able to continue operating uh, going into the future. There are some aspects of this that are not within uh, the powers of the Scottish Parliament. Um, I worked very hard with the theatre sector um, in relation to the UK Treasury uh, and tax reliefs for venues. And uh, I think we were able to be successful in increasing the timescale and the operation of tax exemptions for venues, including theatres. And uh, I think that, I, well, I know that to be materially important uh, to venues' abilities to continue uh, trading. So I think we're going to have to be very alive uh, to uh, that, but all of the uh, other pressures as well. And I look forward to continuing to work with the theatre sector. But I think the key, the key point in Mr Cameron's question was evidence before uh, and now that the evidence has been given uh, I think it's important that we reflect on the assurances that have been given by Creative Scotland that have been given by myself and the self-evident fact that there is no detriment uh, to Creative Scotland's ability to fund the regularly funded organisations and they'll be receiving those that funding that they were expecting in the next weeks. 
Um, th th thank you for that answer. I mean, with the greatest of respect, I don't think people will be reassured um, following this session and indeed the last week. And I think people will uh, not believe that there is, quote, no detriment. That's certainly not the picture um, that, it, that is happening out there. Can I ask about reserves? Um, because we're talking here about not 10% not of Creative Scotland's reserves. We're talking about almost 40%. It's a huge proportion of their reserves being used. And what I don't understand is that in February 2023, this year, when John Swinney made his commitment to reinstate the 6.6 .6 million to Creative Scotland, he did so saying this was precisely so that it didn't have to replace grant funding. And he said, um, and I'll quote him, I will provide an uplift of 6.6 .6 million for Creative Scotland for 2023-24 to ensure their reserve funding can supplement rather than replace grant funding. A mere seven months later, that position has been abandoned. Um, and perhaps the Cabinet Secretary can explain why. Well, I, I'm sure the convener wouldn't wish me to repeat, although if Mr Cameron wants me to, I would be delighted to repeat the evidence that I gave in my opening statement about the changed financial circumstances, about the additional pressures on the budget. He, he was here. He heard that. If he needs to hear it again, I'd be, I'd be happy to share that um, with the committee. To the start of his question, he asserted that organisations will not be assured. Is he saying the regularly funded organisations will not be assured when they receive their funding? That would surprise me. Uh, Creative Scotland um, are informing uh, their regularly funded organisations who will be able to receive their funding within the next weeks um, that they will indeed be receiving their funding as planned. So I imagine they are significantly assured, even if Mr uh, Cameron uh, is not. In relation to the difference between the start of the year and the end of the year, that should be obvious to any fair-minded person and um, I would appeal to people's fair-mindedness uh, in understanding the extreme financial pressures that there are but also to appreciate that given that we're at the end of the year we are getting closer to the beginning and the introduction of the multi-annual year funding uh, of the regularly funded organizations so Creative Scotland it is for them to explain um, their funding mechanisms, and no doubt you will have them back here to give, um, to give evidence, will have been beginning to need to draw down their reserves to spend on their multi-annual funding uh, of organisations one way uh, or the other. And the commitment has been given um, that they will be provided uh, with that funding uh, in, the, in, in the normal way uh, next year. And so there is no detriment um, in relation to the, the reserves and funding that is available for them in terms of managing this transition to regularly funded uh, organisations. Um, can I ask about Scotland's international reputation? And you've, you've, you've already given evidence this morning about Scotland being world leading. But last week, this committee heard about the damage that the Scottish Government's funding decisions are doing to our international rep reputation. We've heard about organisations that can't tour due to a lack of funding and being outstripped, Scotland being outstripped by touring groups from other countries. And Francesca Heggie of the Edinburgh International Festival told this committee that a number of European festivals were so concerned by the distress caused by um, the financial position that they offered to put together, um, I think she described it as an aid package for the Edinburgh International Fund, uh, Festival this year. Um, do you accept that our reputation has been damaged? Well, the first thing is um, I, I accept that Scotland has an extremely high international reputation when it comes to culture, and I wouldn't want to contribute in any way to undermining that. 
Uh, I think if we look at the success of the festivals this year, and they have been extremely successful, it wouldn't be right to create an impression that they have not been the success that they uh, have been. And, you know, I would just observe again only last week, uh, sitting in a room with a sizable international uh, attendance, all of which, all of which were praising Scotland's uh, cultural um, uh, sector, and in this context it was uh, fine art in the national uh, galleries. Um, in terms of international uh, funding comparisons, um, uh, is there more uh, that we can be doing in Scotland? Absolutely. And that is why we are developing an international culture strategy. Uh, to make sure that we are working together, and that includes our, <coughs> includes our, our uh, regularly funded organisations, includes our major festivals, it includes cultural organisations that have international outreach. Some of those are supported and funded by the Scottish Government, and some of them are not. Um, and some are funded to a greater extent, and some are funded uh, to a, a lesser extent. Uh, but we need to make sure that we're doing everything that we can um, in terms of Scotland's international reach. And I know that there is significant ambition in relation to touring. I accept that. It's, you know, the, 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 the touring of uh, different orchestras or, or th theatre companies, um, which is extremely successful, is one that I look forward uh, to continuing. Um, but I think it's really important that whilst we acknowledge the, the pressures that different organisations, including festivals, are under, and I will be meeting with the Edinburgh Festival shortly to discuss this, that we do not in, inadvertently um, uh, find ourselves in a situation where we are uh, undermining that reputation internationally. There's a balance to be struck. Thank you. Thank you. Ms Forbes. Thanks very much. Um, some more general questions. I mean, you outlined quite helpfully, I think, at the beginning, that at the end of the day, if one budget line in the Scottish Government goes up, then another line has to equally fall. I mean, it is just the basic facts of maths. We hear lots of calls, generally, all of us sit in the chamber, for increased funding on things like the NHS and local government, all of which are legitimate. When was the last time someone came to you and said, here's an idea for increasing the budget line for culture, take it from here? I can say with 100% certainty I have not received any communication from any other parliamentarian or party suggesting that. So I've heard calls for this to happen and that to happen, more this, more that. I've had zero suggestions uh, about um, where funding would be found from elsewhere to deal with uh, funding pressures elsewhere. I suppose a follow-on question from that is that, of course, uh, one of the other opportunities, quite clearly, the bulk of our budget is, is still set by, by grant and fixed. But we're all very aware of uh, some of the economic challenges, inflation, energy, energy costs, uh, but also our economy not growing at the pace and the speed that we would like it to. And I was really struck by Creative Scotland's written evidence about the huge economic driver that culture is. So um, from memory, I think that uh, the, the sort of cultural contribution in terms of GVA has increased by 62% since 2010. And actually, their staff workforce has increased by 9%, which tells its own story in terms of uh, an economic driver. What do you see in the coming years could be done in terms of continuing to support the culture sector and make that massive contribution? And how do we ensure that it's as widely recognised as possible? So, so there's a lot in that. I mean, the first thing is acknowledging the scale of the economic benefit of the culture uh, sector is, is hugely significant. Uh, and we need to do everything that we can to make sure that that success continues. And yes, that is about government providing the funding that it is able to do, but it's also about creating the circumstances in which they can th thrive in their own terms. Uh, and be sustainable uh, and make sure that there are um, parallel funding streams um, as well. I think one of the areas that I've, I, I, have, um, I am most optimistic about 
because it's new in terms of benefit uh, to the wider economy, in terms of its significance, is in relationship to the screen sector. Mm. Because we've gone from a, a position where festivals, for example, have been successful since their inception. And as we know in Edinburgh's case, you're talking about going back to the, um, uh, to the late 1940s. What is new um, is that beyond um, having a very small scale, comparatively speaking, uh, screen sector, um, uh, you know, occasional filmmaking and work at BBC, STV, now an increasing amount with, with Channel 4 and others, we are seeing a burgeoning uh, of the wider screen sector. We've gone from not having a single large-scale um, uh, studio with appeals for you know, famous Scottish actors to open them up in the 1980s and 90s, and it not happening, uh, to us now having studios right across the country, and there are more to come. So we've got to a, a situation and a trajectory, and this has been borne out by the report that was published um, by Screen Scotland, that Screen, I think I'm right in saying from, from memory, its, its value is uh, nearly £650 million GVA, with a trajectory to be worth over £1 billion by 2030. And that has a massive positive impact on our economy. We want to do everything that we can to support that. We want to make sure that that's something that um, brings benefit everywhere in Scotland. And we need to embrace the opportunity that that will give for a new generation of people to find employment uh, in those sectors. The, these are sectors where we exported our talent and we didn't have the financial benefit of, uh, of them being here. So whether it's the established and successful parts of the, uh, the, the cultural economy, uh, or it, if it's newer uh, bits of, the, um, of the, the, the wider sector, we need to acknowledge their, their value, we need to do everything that we can support them. And that's a really good example where, compared to the level of, of value, the intervention through Scottish Government funding via Screen Scotland, on the likes of its produ production growth fund, is minuscule in comparison with the, the wider um, uh, value that is accrued to the Scottish economy. So the challenge is to make sure that we are providing funds in a way that helps sustainability, helps growth, um, uh, helps new starts, um, and at the same time is, is what is required for more established um, uh, events, including uh, festivals, at a time of, of change, and that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm interested in discussing with um, with colleagues in the in the festivals uh, sector to make sure that, that things are as, as successful as they can be. Per perhaps a comment, mm -hmm. just in terms of a question. Feel free to comment in mm -hmm. return. But it's all, also a bulwark against depopulation, mm -hmm. because organisations like MG Alipa for example, being situated outside the central belt and not even on the mainland, at a time of growth, are attracting huge numbers of people to the islands who might not have otherwise lived in the islands. And I just put that on the record because it's not just about that stark national growth, it's also about the disproportionate impact on our islands. Yeah, so, so two things to that. I mean, one, one a, um, a wider cultural but also linguistic point which is, I'm well aware of the fragile nature of um, Gaelic-speaking Scotland, Gaelic-speaking communities. The importance of one's own community being uh, reflected in one's own language, and that's where, whether it's in terms of television or radio, but wider uh, arts um, uh, as well, uh, that um, we have... Uh, support that um, uh, uh, helps provide uh, television and, and radio provision in, in, in the Gaelic language um, and does have an impact on different communities where there are you know, BBC, um, uh, BBC studios in, in Inverness, <coughs> in uh, Stornoway and, 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 and elsewhere. I'd also draw people's attention to other organisations that I think that are really important in, in, in this respect. And I think we should also acknowledge that some of this is kind of difficult to capture in metrics, and nor should it necessarily be so. Uh, I was at an event last year celebrating two years of success for the Culture Collective, and I don't know if you've, if you've ever taken evidence from, from them, uh, who are supported through Creative Scotland, 
who are funded through the Scottish Government, um, who provide um, f hugely important fun funding uh, for freelance creatives to, um, to practice their art in communities right across Scotland. When one walked into the uh, into the uh, reception last night at the Storytelling Centre in the festival, there's a map of Scotland with a little dot where all of these people were from, and it was right across Scotland. And the testimonial evidence of what they have been able to do, the impact that they've been able to have, and, when, and we've already talked a little bit about health and well-being and, and other things which are really important for better governance and, and living in a, in a better society. To my mind, what they do is absolutely mission critical um, in us um, uh, um, making the interventions that, that we want to, in addition to them just being able to practice their arts in their communities. There was, there was one person who spoke about being the only person that he knew working in culture in the community that he lived in, uh, which reflects that in some parts of the country, um, that is a less than optimal situation for them to find. The good news is that we now have two years of experience of funding people to be able to and to, to operate as, as creative uh, freelancers uh, right across Scotland. So there's a lot of good stuff that is happening. There's more that can, can be done with that. And it gives me an opportunity to congratulate uh, the Culture Collective in front of the uh, committee for, for the wonderful work that, they've, uh, the work that they've done. But I think there's much in the challenge of depopulation that we need to think about, that, um, uh, that uh, we ensure that our cult cultural institutions right across Scotland um, continue to be uh, supported and if there are other ways in which we should be doing more of that, um, particularly within our, our, our different linguistic communities, that's something that I'm very keen to be supportive of. Thank you. Thank you. I echo your comments about the Culture Collective. They're key contributors to our report on culture and communities and uh, I fully support what you've said about them, Cabinet Secretary. Can I bring in Mr Ruskell, please? Yeah, thanks. Um, I mean, your, your portfolio budget is, is minuscule, really, compared to many other portfolios. I mean, it, it's several orders of magnitude, um, smaller than, than health. And I'm just thinking about, you know, the challenges that that perhaps poses, particularly when you have major events, which is a, a big multi-million pound budget, international stage, um, sitting alongside culture, which is primarily about funding these incredible organisations that exist within our communities and all the benefits that that, that, that delivers. Um, I mean, it feels like there's, there's a tension there in terms of funding, and I think what you've announced today suggests quite a major shift in thinking within the government about how major national events are funded. Can you, can you explore that a little bit more? And it, it, it feels that this is partly about lessons from UCI, which I agree was a fantastic success, but... Um, but I'm wondering if there are, there are other, other contexts to this as well. So there are a number of key facts in Mr Ruskell's uh, question. The size of the portfolio budget relative to the rest of, of government, uh, but also certain responsibilities within the portfolio that have wider government um, benefit. Uh, so he's right to say that major events is one of them. The census is another. Uh, which um, falls, of course, every 10 years. But, you know, there is a significant risk um, of financial displacement within a small portfolio if one has major, uh, if one has major responsibilities um, uh, uh, but not necessarily specific funding. Now, there has been, in the past, intervention for particular support for the likes of the census. Um, and I think this is a really good example of um, Scottish Government recognition of the cross-government benefits that major events can bring. And uh, th there will be uh, wider discussions about, uh, about how that is approached in future as well, because uh, I think one of, the, one of the side effects of Scotland becoming as successful as it has, has been in recent years with uh, major events um, I think necessitates us thinking about uh, how we do all of that. And I don't think anybody wants to see there being a displacement effect within um, the, the wider portfolio, uh, it, which includes 
uh, of course culture, but also includes external affairs. So our ability, uh, going back to Mr Cameron's point, um, of being able to project, amongst other things, uh, our cultural offering in the rest of the world. So it's really important that we, uh, that we maintain um, all of these um, different areas of the, the portfolio's uh, work to do, to do what we are trying to do to promote uh, Scotland domestically and, and internationally. So yes, no doubt there are going to be, um, there are going to be conversations about uh, how do we um, make sure that we have that cross-government approach to uh, major events. But there's also an acknowledgement that one of the benefits of major events working uh, hand in hand with uh, the, the culture director in the Scottish Government is that we have a lot of people in the civil service working in culture who are extremely talented in the organisation of events, whether those are cultural events or w whether those are wider events that are, are hosted in, in Scotland. So there are reasons why major events work closely together with culture. I think the question going forward is whether um, uh, the, the funding model is fit for the place that we now find ourselves in, having had the good experience that we've had of major events, which is essentially um, since 2014 in the Commonwealth Games, we have, we've seen these really large, world-class events, and we have the aspiration to do more. So we need to make sure that we've got the right mechanisms, funding is a part of that, to make sure that we're, we're able to do that. And what do you see the role of the UK government in funding those major events. I mean, I think we've, we've discussed this previously that um, despite UCI being a, a major success, there was really no, there was really no funding from UK government for what was ostensibly still a kind of GB event. Do you, do you see a, do you see a way of working with the UK government that could bring in more partnership funding from that side? Well, other I, events that are still to come yeah, and well, still to be. I'm, I'm always open to working with um, uh, authorities. Firth of, um, of Scotland, um, and there was, in the case of Cycling UK, a wider UK organisation with, with whom we worked very closely with and very well mm -hmm. in terms of helping deliver an event where it was a GB team uh, performing at, a, at an event in Scotland funded through the Scottish Government. So, you know, that we, we have to work our way through sometimes Scotland. Um, uh, Scotland uh, competes internationally uh, as an independent country, um, and in, in some it's in a wider GB or UK uh, context. And um, there will always be a discussion with UK authorities and UK government partners about how we can do all of that. One thing I would say, however, that is as yet unresolved w with this, and this is something that we debated in the chamber uh, the, other, the other day, is if there is to be funding uh, that is to be provided in areas where the devolved uh, oversight for those um, is in this place. I think there is, uh, there is as an unyet um, uh, resolved issue of, um, of the ability of parliamentarians to scrutinise um, how all of that works. You will have me in, and I, I can't remember, convener, how many times it is now to give uh, to give evidence, and I will happily continue to do that. Um, I, it is now par for the course that UK government ministers refuse to give evidence um, to this parliament, even although they are becoming ever more involved in, uh, in devolved areas and not always in benign ways. But where we can be working together, and, and take, for example, the, uh, the home nation's approach to the um, uh, to the f uh, forthcoming footballing um, uh, events, that that is somewhere where we will we we will be working with other governments in the UK and the government of the Republic of Ireland, and the footballing authorities. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, as as we have shown with other events, we are more than capable of doing that, and uh, we want to do that in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Um, I think. It Conscious of time, because we are on our agenda item to get through this morning. But, uh, so I suspect a final question, please, from Mr Bibby. Uh, thank, thanks, Confina. Um, you've cited a, a number of times inflation has been the reason behind the uh, decision to uh, cut the £6.6 .6 million. Pounds. Obviously, there are huge pressures in terms of the cost of living and, and inflationary pressures which affect government, but also many people in the, in the culture sector too. When the promise was made to... Um, provide that essential funding of 6.6 .6 million. Inflation was running at 10.4%. Now, when over the 
last few months that's fallen to 6.7 per cent. Now, that's far too high. I want to be clear that that remains far too high. Um, but if inflationary reasons were the reason for reneging on the promise, why was it made in the first place when inflation was at 10.4 per cent? Um, and when did it become clear that you wouldn't be able to keep this promise? Or was it a promise that deep down you knew you couldn't keep? So, uh, frankly, unnecessarily pointed questions from Mr. Uh, Bibby, who heard me, who heard me give, because he's been in since the beginning of the session, who he heard me not only draw attention to the inflation rate, but mission critically in the context of having a serious approach to funding culture and appreciation of the additional pressure on the Scottish budget because of pay settlements. I updated the committee on the fact that that has seen an additional £785 million, so a significant amount of money, um, bringing additional pressure on the Scottish Government uh, budget. And uh, in, in, in reference to the, the question that was asked by, by Kate Forbes in all of this, given the displacement impact that additional cost over it. So I'm not talking about inflation, the fact that that means you can buy less. It's the additionality of the likes of pay claims, which squeezes the government's uh, uh, budget, means that that displaces the ability to do everything that we'd want. I mean, it's really, really, really basic um, uh, public administration and, and finance, the point that I'm making here. So unless somebody is wanting to be serious about explaining about how one deals with that pressure, so where is one going to find money from elsewhere, is one able to then broach the pressures, deal with the pressures that one is having to face? And it seems to me eminently sensible that if one has the ability to use reserves to then not actually cut so end funding for organisations, that that is the best course of action. Now, if Mr Bibby would prefer us to cut cultural budget lines in areas where there is no reserves, he has to explain how one is going to do it. And I've not heard that from anybody thus far. So it seems to me that in the circumstances that we find ourselves for reasons that, again, any fair-minded person would acknowledge are significant and are really extreme, that given those pressures, where there are reserves that can deal with a situation in extremis and can then be recompensed to make sure that ongoing financial and planning um, uh, purposes can be uh, fulfilled, that is the prudent, the sensible um, and the sustainable kind of decisions that we are making, because if not, one is then talking about ending financial support for cultural organisations, which I'm not prepared to do. I'm, I'm aware of the pressures. I'm, the point is, you were aware of the pressures in February. When you I was not course. aware of 780... F sorry, let me get the number right. I don't know if Mr Bibby was aware of 780... £85 million pounds additional, because I wasn't. It's something that's well, happened since, since uh, the time that he's mm. referred to. So, again, I make my point about fair-mindedness. If there is an acknowledgement that that is an additional and new pressure, nobody had a crystal ball about the extent to which funding settlements would be pursued. And I draw attention to colleagues that they have not all been resolved, so there is the potential for additional pressures above and beyond uh, budgeted uh, measures. That given that, one has to make decisions on the basis of the facts as we find them now towards the end of the year. And now that we are at the end of the financial year, I and my colleagues are doing everything that we can to make sure that there is not a cut to Creative Scotland's um, ability to uh, fund regularly funded organisations. And as we have now heard repeatedly in this committee, as in fact this committee heard last week from Ian Munro himself, there will not be detriment to the regularly funded organisations through Creative Scotland's uh, budgetary uh, processes. And beyond that, um, the uncontracted spend right across uh, the culture sector, which otherwise would uh, have to have, have faced massive cuts, are now not. Mr Brown has indicated a very small supplementary. If I can be taken in two minutes, Mr Brown. 
Yeah, it will only require a yes or no answer if the Cabinet Secretary is able to do that. Just to say, I think you and I, convener, are the ones that have, on this committee that have been here longest, and in the 16 years I've been here, I've never heard a proposal from an opposition party to increase the culture budget, just to go on the record with that. However, I asked a number of the contributors last week if they could provide any evidence of comparative devolved uh, areas and how they were, because we are duty bound to look at other areas in which we could increase the budget, um, if they could give any evidence of comparative and the ones that were provided. First of all, Canada, I think Korea, and then subsequently Quebec and Catalonia aren't really comparable. So if the government has any information on how other devolved areas as akin to Scotland as is possible, it would be useful if the government could provide that information uh, to, to the committee if they want to see it. I think we will look, but I don't think that we will find. I mean, the, the big difference between all of the places that Mr Brown outlines um, to this committee and their financial ability to raise income in a way that the Scottish Government is not. I've heard claims in the last couple of days about Scotland uh, having the most powerful devolved parliament um, uh, in, in the world, which is, is frankly not true. If we look at a number of the uh, places that Mr Brown uh, has mentioned already, they have significant powers beyond Scotland's to be able to secure the financial means to do with situations in a time of extremis. Scotland is extremely constrained in our budgetary powers and our ability uh, to find additional uh, monies in times of, of, of financial distress. And that's why, in this context, it's mission critical to understand that where we have reserves in, in the public purse, so to speak, that if and when we, we reach a rainy day where we really need the funds to be able to get ourselves through difficult times, uh, that we're able to use them. That's exactly what we have done. We've done it in a way that will not provide detriment um, to, in this case, uh, Creative Scotland. That is a good thing. There is a wider issue going forward. Um, and you will have me back, no doubt, for further evidence sessions about the budget in, in future years. And I'll be delighted to hear both from uh, MSPs of governing parties, but also of opposition parties, if there are serious proposals to increase, in this case, the culture budget and from where the money will come. I have not heard that once in my time as culture secretary. Okay. I think uh, that note, we have to draw the session to a close. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and Ms Cooper for their attendance at committee this morning. We now go into private session for a further agenda item. Thank you.